Okay, in the last lesson then, we looked at the social learning theory of aggression. I hope you found the video helpful. Um, today we're going to go on and look at the next psychological theory in aggression, which comes from uh, Zimbardo, which you should remember from your AS studies, Zimbardo Prison Experiment, um, and his theory of de-individuation. Um, and this is the idea that behaviour... Um, is different for individuals in groups than when they're on their own. Um, and the idea that Zimbardo came up with was that when part of an anonymous group, people lose their own personal identity, hence de-individuation, um, and they act in a different way uh, in a group than they would on their own. Uh, and we need to look at how that could potentially then affect someone's level of aggression. The individuation theory then can be used to explain uh, violence in groups, why crowds of maybe football hooligans get together uh, and can act differently to the way an individual would act on their own. Um, the first idea of this came from Gastoff Le Bon in 1895, who used the idea of a collective mind, he called it, um, where groups get together and due to terms such as anonymity, so not being uh, accountable for your own actions, suggestibility, so people um, having an idea, oh, let's smash that shop window through, yeah, that sounds like a good idea, um, or contagion, so an idea... Uh, maybe starting in a group and then spreading throughout that group can lead sorry, to a loss of self-control um, and cause people to act in ways that maybe go against their own personal moral beliefs or the beliefs of normal social, well, normal social society that goes against the social norms. Um, and obviously that can start to explain why people may be aggressive in these groups. What is it then about these groups that lead to this uh, loss of inhibition and this uh, increase in anonymity. Well, several factors Zimbardo has said uh, could lead to that. One of those is um, wearing uniforms. That would increase anonymity. So if everyone's wearing the same, then you might find that people don't have that individuality uh, and also will act differently in the groups. An example of this may be the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, we'll, we'll look at that in a bit further detail later in the topic, but obviously they're all wearing the same, uh, and that may change their, their, their behaviour in the group than it would if they're on their own. Uh, another idea from Zimbardo is that within groups, there's often um, substances which may cause uh, a different state of mind, such as drugs or alcohol, um, and that could have an impact as well on decision-making um, and why people may act a bit differently in a group than they would maybe when they're on their own. Um, so what you find is that people that maybe normally wouldn't be aggressive um, because they fear for being identified uh, and it goes against the social norms, they find that there's no accountability then in the group. Um, it reduces normal restraints, normal inner restraints, and increases usually inhibited behaviour. Um, and so people are changing their actions. What you'll find is that the larger the group, the more likely there is that people would change their behaviour. There's less fear of negative evaluation, uh, and that's going to change how people act. Okay, so is there any proof this is happening or not then? Um, what research have we got to support the theory or not? Well, uh, in 1969, Zimbardo conducted a study uh, to test the idea of the anonymity. Is it anonymity, um, people not knowing who's, who's doing the, the act, that actually causes aggression or not? Um, to study this, he conducted a study in which he had groups of four female undergraduate students give electric shocks um, to another participant to aid learning, much like the Milgram study. Um, but this time he was testing this anonymity theory. So what he did, he had half of the groups, um, half of the group, so it was an independent measure design, um, where lab coats, these big lab coats, these hoods, uh, kind of to hide their face, uh, they sat in separate cubicles, so they were, they were very uh, anonymous, um, and they never had their name read aloud, they didn't meet anyone else, they were on their own. The other half of the participants uh, could wear their own clothes, they had big name badges on so people who knew, knew who they were uh, and they could see the other participants in the group. So basically the first group had a high level of anonymity and the second group didn't have a high level of anonymity. What they found was on every single occasion the anonymous group gave higher shocks 
um, to the participants suggesting that there's more aggression, more violence, more shocks um, when we are anonymous than when we're not uh, and suggesting that maybe Zimbardo was right in his theory that it's the anonymity side of things that allows us to uh, or allows individuals to uh, be more aggressive in groups. What other research do we have then? Well, there is other research looking at the idea of uniforms. Do uniforms have a, an impact on aggression? Um, and there's also the idea that, as we mentioned before, the larger the group, the worse the outcome could be. And again, that, both of these ideas have been supported by research. So REM, in 1987, um, randomly assigned school children to one of two conditions. They were playing handball um, and... They were either told that they would be in a group, so five players per team, a group who were wearing orange uniforms or a group uh, who were just wearing their own normal street clothes. Um, as predicted by uh, de-individuation theory, the group who were wearing the orange uniform, they had this, again, maybe anonymity, uh, they had this group cohesion, they would do things in groups that they wouldn't do on their own. They found that that group wearing the orange clothing um, they committed far more aggressive acts than the school children who were wearing their own street clothes. And again, that adds support, doesn't it, to the fact that um, this anonymity, the, uh, the, the uniforms in the groups, that adds to the aggression. The, the big thing here is that they, they were randomly assigned to groups. So it wasn't as though these were kids who were, who were already uh, as part of this team because you could claim that maybe there are individual differences there in terms of, well, maybe uh, aggressive people club together. This was significant because any of the kids could have ended up in that technically any of the kids could have ended up in that uh, uniform condition um, and they ten tended to be the more aggressive ones. So that's a really interesting finding. Maybe wearing the uniforms um, led to the aggression. The second finding then was by Mullen in 1986 um, and Mullen uh, investigated lynchings, so basically group attacks on people uh, in the United States between, nine, uh, sorry, between 1899 uh, and 1946 um, and what was found was that the larger the group, the more horrific the beatings were, again supporting the idea that uh, the larger the group, the worse the outcome is going to be. So again, with the Zimbardo study, with the REM study, with the Mullen study, it's providing a lot of research support for the idea that de-individuation could be leading to um, aggressive acts. As with any theory or piece of research, we can't just take it at face value. We need to take an analytical standpoint um, and start looking at some evaluations. This will obviously help with your essays and the exam technique in terms of AO2 points. Uh, one of the ways of doing this is looking at the issues, debates and approaches, one of which is gender bias. Um, and so looking at maybe if there's a difference between males and females in terms of their de-individuation uh, and responses to aggression. Cannon Vale in 1970 did exactly this. So looked at uh, groups of males, groups of females, and looked at are there any gender differences there uh, in terms of how aggressive people get under conditions of de-individuation. And they actually found that it was only in the all-male groups that they found increased aggression. So suggesting that maybe there is a gender bias there. Maybe this is only a male-only phenomenon. Um, Dinah also found the same, so another bit of research there, and looked at actually it's maybe the disinhibition of aggression in terms of normally we're inhibited, normally stop ourselves being aggression, uh, sorry, aggressive, um, and they actually found that, yeah, that was again only the case in males. Males were the only ones that would show this disinhibition, and so maybe in terms of aggression uh, specifically, disinhibition is only a male phenomenon. You could potentially counter that with the, the, the bit of research we mentioned before in terms of Zimbardo because they were looking at uh, female participants but you know this isn't a, a black or white this is a well maybe this is something we need to take into account maybe there are differences between males and females in terms of how disinhibition affects their aggression. Another route to IDA marks is through applications of theories. Um, so, you know, some will have a theory, but do these actually apply in real world situations? Um, and we can use that for de individuation. Um, can we actually look at where in the real world uh, the theory of de individuation 
uh, has been applied to examples and Leon Mann in 1981 did exactly this um, and what Leon, my man, did was to uh, look at 21 suicide attempts um, which occurred in America uh, in the 1960s and 70s um, and what Leon man, uh, found was that um, in 10 out of 21 of those suicide attempts crowd baiting had happened so the crowd had kind of encouraged the person to to jump off the building or the bridge or whatever it was they were jumping off pretty pretty yeah reprehensible behavior not 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 what you would expect an individual to do is encourage another person to kill themselves um, so Leon <laughs> looked at um, well, why why did that happen? What what were the circumstances that surrounded it happening? Why did it maybe happen in those ten cases where it happened, and and not the the other eleven um, that it didn't happen in? And actually, um, Liam um, suggested that deindividuation had a role to play. There was something about the environment and the circumstances that happened in those. 10 events that wasn't present in the other 11 um, and blamed de-individuation. The, the, the common circumstances were that it happened at night time, um, so almost under the cover of dark, there was anonymity there, um, people m may have thought that they couldn't be blamed um, for, for the incidents. Um, the, when the people were a long distance away from the, the suicide suicidal person again there, there's physical distance there so they're almost um, taking themselves away from from the situation um, and also when uh, there was a large crowd again that that that's typical deindividuation what, what we've been looking at in the theory and the rest of the research so when a person cannot be held responsible themselves they partake in these these uh, acts maybe not necessarily aggressive in terms of suicidal but again not something you would expect to see um, and something that definitely adds weight to the theory of uh, de-individuation um, and is why it's a this IDA issue debate and approach and it is a very practical um, application of of the theory. Other evaluations then can come from different studies that have looked into aggression and deindividuation. Um, Johnson and Downing in 1979 uh, conducted a study that was quite similar to Zimbardo's 1969 study that I mentioned earlier, um, where they provided they had a control group. They provided one group with um, of the female students with cloaks and things to, to give them some sort of anonymity. This time, Johnson and Downing um, had three groups. One of the groups were dressed uh, as Ku Klux Klan members um, with white sheets, white hoods, um, and they observed how, how they behaved. A second group were dressed as nurses, um, and the third group were the control group. And again, they were asking them to give uh, pretend shocks to, to other participants. What they found was that the members dressed as Ku Klux Klan members Members, or the participants dressed uh, like that, they actually gave more shocks than the control group, but significantly the, the group dressed as nurses gave fewer shocks than the control group. Uh, this acts as an evaluation because it says, well, maybe it's not just about this group membership, but it's actually about the, the what they call the local group norm. So what is expected of a, a KKK member? Well, to be aggressive. What's expected of a nurse? Well, to to not maybe give shocks. And so that, that can be used as, as an evaluative point uh, as well. I just want to finish off then by talking about um, three other studies that could potentially be linked to deindividuation and again used as some sort of an evaluation. Uh, the first of those was a study conducted by Robert Watson, who's an anthropologist, um, and he investigated 23 um, tribes and societies and, and looked at war behaviour in those societies um, and wanted to see whether maybe de-individuation had a part to play in uh, the types of behaviour that were seen in um, acts, specifically obviously aggressive acts. So he looked at, well, what was it about these societies that were maybe 
particularly aggressive in war in terms of kind of killing and torture and mutilation of their enemies um, and had the idea that potentially it had to do with deindividuation. So looked at things such as wearing war paint which might disguise them and again uh, big costumes that kind of takes away from the individual uh, and might lead these uh, societies to being more aggressive uh, and lo and behold that's exactly what he found. So out of these 23 societies um, he found that 10 of them tended to be quite low on the, on the aggressive scale in terms of uh, killing and mutilation. Out of those 10, 7 were the ones that had no, no change in their appearance. They didn't dress up in these costumes, they didn't wear this war paint um, and show low levels or maybe lower levels of aggression, whereas obviously there were still three um, societies in which that they did wear this war paint and um, but still did maybe have some aggression levels. The significant finding was the 13 societies in which they did find high levels of killing and mutilation and torture and uh, aggressive war acts. Out of those 13, 12 of them had war paint and costumes and so we can maybe using de-individuation theory, suggests that that could potentially be one of the reasons behind it because they were taking away from the individual, obviously then leaving one culture who still were aggressive without the change. But that that adds, again, some um, you know a a applicable support to, to this theory of de-individuation. Secondly, there was a study conducted by Posmes and Spears in 1999, um, and they conducted a meta-analysis of 60 studies uh, looking into de-individuation, and actually found that um, there wasn't greater levels of antisocial behaviour in larger groups. So obviously that would go against the idea that, that de-individuation leads to aggression. Uh, and there was a final study by Francis et al. that said, that, well, actually maybe de-individuation uh, de is a positive thing. Um, they actually found that adolescents going through mental health issues were much more likely to talk about these um, in the anonymity, the de-individuated setting of an internet chat room than they were uh, kind of live face to face and so that's kind of a positive outcome and it's, so it's not saying that there's this maybe deterministic um, negative outcome that de-individuation will always lead to aggression there are there are other um, situations that that it can lead to Okay, that's pretty much it then about de-individuation. Um, the only other thing you'll need to know is that in the exam you won't be asked directly about de-individuation theory. You'll be asked about social psychological theories of aggression. So it could be one 24 marker outline and evaluate social psychological theories of aggression in which you can use social learning theory and de-individuation, or you can be asked to maybe compare two so, 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 uh, social psychological theories um, in which obviously uh, de-individuation is a part of that. So you're talking um, maximum really kind of four AO1 and eight AO2 um, in, terms of, in, in terms of the actual marks that you'll need for the de-individuation topic. Okay, thanks for watching and look out for the next video.